I think this one the lights faded. So we have the stress strain law like Tij equal F0 delta Ij plus F1 Bij plus F minus 1 B inverse Ij where these Fs these are functions of first, second and third invariants of B or C and gamma can be 1, 0 or minus 1. Okay. It raises a very good question um, and the question is that in this constitutive equation if say N is an eigenvector of B then Bij and j equals say B times Ni. So B is the eigenvalue and N is the eigenvector, right? And this is, uh, this will give us principal directions of stretches in the current configuration, in the deformed shape. If you work with C, then you get in the undeformed shape. Okay, now if we look at this, then T i j and j equal F 0, delta i j and j, well let me write it, so plus F 1, B i j and j plus F minus 1, B inverse i j and j, right? So, so what is this equal to? B times N i. This thing is N i and this one is 1 over B times N i. Because the eigenvalue of B inverse will be reciprocal of the eigenvalue of B. So this one, what does it say? It says that we get F 0 plus F1 B plus F minus 1 over B times Ni. So eigenvectors of B are the same as the eigenvectors of T. So principal axis of strain in the current configuration in the deformed shape are also principal axis of stresses in the deformed shape. Is it okay? However, the converse is false. Yeah, I know you see you are surprised too. The converse is false. Principal axis of stress need not be principal axis of strain unless some conditions are imposed on F1 and F minus 1. Like, see, simple problem when I was your age, like sitting on that side. So the question came up um, in my mind, not. Uh, so if I take this bar, it's true that if I stretch it, like, like you mentioned, if I assume the stretches, then I can find stresses. Now what, what? will happen if I apply load. It's an isotropic material. Right? How do I know that this axial load will produce stretches? One of them is along this direction and the other two are perpendicular to it. And to give you the counter example, I think some of you are wondering um, this, um, what is he saying? So it's a, the example we did this morning We, we talk, this is an elastic material, right? Because in this case, free energy depends upon third invariant of B and we derive this is an elastic material. So what are the principal axis of stress? 
what are the principal axes of T i j? All vectors, every vector is a principal axis of T i j. Take any vector you like is principal axis of T i j, but will it be a principal axis of strain? It need not be because all we know is this that the only way strain is coming into picture is the third third invariant or determinant of f or determinant of c right so if, so the converse is false unless you put some conditions or restrictions on f1 and f minus 1 now if you say that f1 is positive and f minus 1 is uh, less than or equal to 0 then then you can prove that the principal axis of uh, stress is also a principal axis of strain. So, if these conditions are satisfied by f 1 and f minus 1, then yes, the principal axis of stress are also principal axis of strain. And incidentally, for Moody regular material, f 1 is C 1 and f minus 1 is C, C 2, and these conditions are satisfied. So, so even though there is no, there is no theoretical reason for me to give you these conditions, but at least for this problem, it shows that if these conditions are satisfied, then a principle of principal axis of stress is also a principal axis of strain. And my colleague, my colleagues uh, said, "This guy is crazy. Why is he saying that? Why do we have to prove it?" Everybody knows principal axis of stress and principal axis of strain coincide for an isotropic material. They do for a for a Hookean material. You don't have to. That's true for a Hookean material. But you still have to assume that mu is positive and three lambda plus two mu is positive. Otherwise, you cannot invert the relationships, or you have to assume they are not zero. So for a Hookean material, the result is trivial because you can invert you can express strains in terms of stresses. Here, we cannot do that. Like, try to solve this equation for rho in terms of t. We don't know. We can't do it. It's true I gave you in the morning p, p v equal to r t, but that's a special case. So, does it make sense? So, we have to, I mean, we did not talk about what conditions we should impose. And same thing when we talked about transversely isotropic materials. Well, again, the coefficients or the functions should satisfy some constraints for us to get a reasonable solution. Does my argument make sense or not? that unless we unless we require this the principal axis of stress this example being need not be a principal axis of strain but the converse is true principal axis of strain must be a principal axis of stress if the material is isotropic it's not true for a transversely isotropic material or an orthotropic material i mean there there is no such guarantee Okay, so we can go to the torsion problem, or you want to say anything more, or ask anything more? We have already, to begin with, we have assumed solutions along the principal directions of the strain. Well, see, we, the purpose of that exercise was only to show you the instability. The purpose of that exercise was not to show you whether principal axis of stress and strain coincide or not. Well, in, in the experiment, in the experiments when they did, they this with the equal loads applied, they were getting equal stretches till the instability point reached. I think what he's asking is that how do we know for a fact that the deformation could be like 
no, I, no we are assuming that no, no nobody knows same thing same thing is going to be in the two example problems i'm going to do now we do not know uh, that the deformation is going to be like that so what we are going to do is we are going to assume a deformation and show that equilibrium equations are satisfied and the boundary conditions are satisfied. So this goes back to um, Rickson. He, when he was your age, roughly, okay, like probably in 30s or so, so somewhere in that, because he proved that result in, I think, 1956 or 1960, around that time frame, and. I'm trying to think how old he was at that time, because now he's uh, 92. No, he's 92 now. Not say he is 92. So that means he was born in what? 1935 or something like that. Or 25? 25. Okay. So that means he was about 30, 30, 32 years old. So he proved. He solved the problem what kind of deformations can be produced in every, the key word is every, hyperelastic material by applying only loads on the boundaries. So if the material is compressible, then only homogeneous deformations can be produced in every, the key word is every, not one specific material. And for an incompressible material, there are five families of deformations that can be produced in every incompressible hyperelastic material. Out of those five families, four he specifically gave. The fifth family. Family means there are more than one members. So the, the fifth family, he gave conditions. And I think it has taken people like 30, 40 years to exhaust the fifth family. And I'm not sure if uh, we have found all solutions or all members of the fifth family or not. But the four, fam four, he very explicitly said, okay, these are the solutions. So whatever member is, it must be of this subclass. But the fifth one, he only said, okay, these are the conditions that should be satisfied. And then people have been exploring that for the last 35, 40 years, trying to find members of that family. I cannot give you how many members they have found because I don't know myself. Uh, but See, if you do a problem like that, a general problem, then you can you can be Einstein, like Sadhana, you know. So he did, uh, when Erickson did this Sadhana at the age of 35 or so. I don't know what he did, I mean, how he found it or how he thought of it, but I mean he proved mathematically that these are the uh, solutions. And now, most of us have been following those footsteps. So the ones I'm going to show you too, now the next two are members of those families. So what it says is um, that you assume the deformation and you can find loads to be applied on the boundaries, not body forces. We are going to assume body forces are zero. That you can apply, you can find surface tractions that will produce those deformations. So you assume deformation, there are a couple of unknowns in it, and then you find B and find T, find equilibrium equation, solves, show that equilib equilibrium equations are satisfied, and then find the loads required to produce those deformations. Okay, so that's what we are going to do for two problems, like one is torsion, and the other is bending. 
So, it is like bending when we do it, it is going to be a rectangular beam bent into a circular arc. That is what we do for small deformation problem also. Um, his family, this family was general like this. So, it is you can do bending, twisting, stretching all combined, but if I do all combined, then the picture becomes muddy and it is not quite clear what are what is going on. So, I am going to really do uh, sp a specific number like only torsion and then only bending, not combine the two, not combined radial expansions here. So, you could in principle take a hollow tube, bend it, expand radially expand it and twist it, but just become the algebra will become a little bit more involved. So, is it okay or should we proceed? So, this was I mean I was not planning on saying anything about this, but anyway you asked me. So, for the torsion problem, so we again take a circular bar and let me see which way is my, I think this is x 3 axis and so this is x 1 and how should I twist it, so it will go down x 2. So, we assume a plane sections remain remains plane ok. This is an assumption like I think you asked me in the morning whether we will have any warping or not. So, it is being ruled out. So, we a plane sections remains plane. So, we have a circle and so this is twisted or by an angle theta. So, this angle is say beta and this point p moves to p prime. So, this point p moves to p prime, it is the same like we were talking p is in the undeformed state and p prime is in the deformed state, but now it just has been rotated. So, what is the um, displacement u 1. So, the final position is O p which we can say is r. So, it is r cosine of theta plus beta minus r cosine beta. same thing we do in linear elasticity. We assume we make the same assumption except in linear elasticity we say the angle of twist theta which is a function of big x or little x in the in the linear elasticity we assume that theta in radians not in degrees is much much less than 1. But here we are not going to make that assumption. So, we are not going to say that the angle of twist per unit length is small. So, that is the basically the main difference between what we are going to do and what we learn in linear elasticity. Okay, so, that is u 1 and u 2 same r sin theta plus beta minus r sin beta and u 3 I think it is not 0, well it depends if I take u 3 equal to 0 that means I am forcing the length not to change. 
Yeah, OK. So I'm forcing the length not to change. And you will see that since I'm forcing the length not to change, I will have to apply an axial pressure, an axial load, which we don't need in linear elasticity. So if you don't apply the axial load, then the bar will either elongate or contract. But to maintain the length, you not only need the torque, but you will also need the axial force. OK, so basically that's, that's it. And then we are going to find material is incompressible, is Navier's, is uh, Mooney Rivlin. And we are going to find Actually, we have been calling it C2, not C minus 1. And we are going to assume that this surface is clamped. Actually, all we are going to really assume is theta at x3 equal to 0 is 0. Because we will need that uh, boundary condition. We will need to fix that one. And then show that what forces are required to produce this deformation. So we are going to find the surface forces required to produce this deformation. And it's a member of the Erickson family. So we know it can be produced in an incompressible, actually he did hyperelastic material, which means stored energy function exists. And in our case, we derived this by assuming, by showing you that indeed the stored energy function exists because it is C1 times I first invariant minus 3 plus I something like C2 times second invariant minus 3. So there, is a, there exists a stored energy function. Since I opened my mouth about stored energy function, there are nonlinear elastic materials for which there is no stored energy function. Okay. There are many, many nonlinear elastic materials. They are called Cauchy materials, Cauchy elastic materials. So when Cauchy derived the stress strain law, he did not assume a stored energy function. The way I did it in the class. I derived that from the Helmholtz free energy, which is roughly speaking equivalent to saying my material is hyperelastic, like there exists a stored energy function. I could have derived the stress strain law without using entropy inequality, um, and that's what Trussell does or did. I mean, he's, he's not dead, but anyway, Trustel in his book, Nonlinear Field Theories of Mechanics, and so they talk about both hyperelastic as well as general elastic materials. So, it's possible, it's this, so there are materials for which there is no stored energy function. Okay, so if we take this, then U1 is X1 minus big X1, this is X2 minus big X2, this is X3 minus big X3. And we can find F. Actually, I'm doing in Cartesian coordinates. So now, should I find F and then B or B, B inverse? Because if I want to do both problems, I'm not sure if we can squeeze both problems. Some well, let me copy it. Then we, at least you you will have the expression because I don't think I gave you. Um, 
in the nodes you have, this is not included. I can read without glasses. Actually, with the glasses, I cannot read it because uh, my glasses are meant for distant uh, looking. And if I use bifocal, then I get headache. So I'm, I didn't. I had bifocal, but eventually I I had to give it up. So I. It's very strange, you know. When I was young, I needed glasses to read even. And now I don't need glasses to read. I don't know. Something. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. So let's let's expand this, and then uh, it will be easier. So u1 or little x1 equals big X1 plus r cosine theta cosine beta minus r sine theta sine beta. And this is really x1, r cosine beta. So, so this is r cosine beta is x1. So this is x1 plus x1 cosine theta minus x2 sine theta. Oh. No, I think I, so this should cancel with that. Yeah, so this is x1, big x1. So this, this should not be there then. And x2, is r sine theta, cosine beta plus r cosine theta sine beta minus r oh this should not be there okay so what is this r sine theta r cosine beta is x1 sine theta plus oh, x2 cosine theta. So now we can write f. So f, so differentiate little x1 with respect to big x1. So that's cosine theta. X1 with respect to big X2, sine theta. Now little x1 with respect to X3. So this theta is a function of X3. And little x3 equals big X3 because we said u3 is 0. Because we said u3 is 0, so little x3 equals big X3. So if now we differentiate this with respect to x3, what will happen? So it will be minus x1 sine theta uh, minus x2 cosine theta. And this whole thing is multiplied with d theta over dx3. Because when you differentiate cosine theta, you will get minus sine theta theta prime, theta d theta over dx3. And what is this thing equal to? This is little x2. So, right? So I can take minus sign outside, and this is little x2. 
and to save my writing, I can write d theta over dx3 as theta prime. There is no confusion because d theta over dx3 um, is only differentiated with respect to x3. Okay, now x2 with respect to x1 sin theta and then cosine theta and if you do it again x1 cosine theta minus x2 sin theta, so you will get x1 theta prime. Oh, this one was minus. I forgot that. And for x3, this is 0, 0, 1. Does it make sense? And then we can find B, FF transpose, and find B inverse. So let's assume it's done. Because you can you can know you can multiply B. So I'm going to raise it and let's assume it's done. So what we get then is the following. The T equals minus P times identity plus C1 times B and that B is 1 plus theta prime square x2 square minus theta prime square x1 x2 minus theta prime x2 1 plus theta prime square x1 square theta prime x1 and 1. This is symmetric, so I do not have to write the other part. Because it's symmetric, so I do not have to write the lower half. And same thing for B inverse. So I am going to erase this. And if I do the B, so that will be C2. B inverse is 1, 0, theta prime x2, 0, 1, minus theta prime x1, and this is 1 plus theta prime square, um, x1 square plus x2 square. I mean, I would have liked to multiply, but I think you can multiply f, f transpose and then take the inverse. Okay, now we equilibrium equations. So, t11, comma 1 plus t1, comma t12, comma 2 plus t13, comma 3 equal to 0, and that gives us. minus delta p over delta x1 that's here and t11 this is also t11 so plus c1 1 plus theta prime square x2 square then uh, there is a term here plus delta over delta x1 of 1, t11, this is all, this is all coming from t11, plus t12, so that is, so m minus c1 theta prime x1 x2 theta prime square x1 x2 and then is 0 here. Then T13, so we have 
minus c1 theta prime x2 and plus c2 theta prime x2. So, that should be 0. So, we copied all the terms, right? I hope. So, this is the first equilibrium equation. And if we do it like differentiate it, what do we get from here? Derivative of 1 is 0, this is a function of x3, that is x2 square, 0, 0. So, when we get something from here because this is differentiated with respect to x2 and we get something from here because there is a theta this is a function of x3. So, we get so delta p over delta x1 equal to um, minus c1 theta prime square x1 and from here minus c1 theta double prime x2 plus c2 theta double prime x2. See, this is minus delta p over delta x1. So, I can take it to the other side, which I did. The rest is sim then this gives 0, this gives 0. That is minus c1 um, theta prime square. Differentiate this with respect to x2, you get x1. And then here you get minus c1 theta double prime. My then plus c2 theta double prime. And then now we work with the next one. So, we will get delta p over delta x2. And then we will get delta p over delta x3. So, I will spare you the pain of ri writing, um, but you can I mean, see that, right? So, I think delta p over, if we look at the third one, So, I did not have white sheets with me. So, I was copying on somebody's manuscript and uh, so I do not know what to do. Let me see. Okay, anyway, I do not have the with me. So, Less what we will get is delta what will be delta p over delta theta. So, that will be delta p over delta r. No, 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 no. What I am going what I want to do is I want to use now um, r theta z coordinate system and show you that p is really only a function of r. That way it will simplify some algebra. And after I do that, assuming it is done, then what are the boundary conditions now? So, on this outer surface, a circle is it has been assumed that a circular tube or circular cylinder is being deformed into a circular cylinder. Right. So, the, the normal to this uh, the boundary, if you look at the normal, outward normal is this. And what are the components of that? If this radius is say A, what are the components? Components of that, so n 
has components x 1 over a, x 2 over a 0. The outward normal, if these coordinates are x 1, x 2, so sin theta which is x 1 over a, sin theta is x 2 over a and this is perpendicular to the x 3 axis, so th third component is 0. So, on this surface then T i j n j is 0. Okay, that is because it is a traction free surface and using this and the fact that we will get um, if I express this in terms of r theta coordinate system I thought I had brought it with me, but do not see it. No, I yeah, I don't have it, but I I can give you rough outline because I I don't have the uh, written. I do have. I have a book with me. Yeah, the problem is in the book. It's solved there. So I have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Except that I have to look at the into the book. Yeah, I, I have it. Okay, even though that was not my intention to. Okay, so we get delta p over delta x one, then delta p over delta x two, and delta p over delta x three, and it does satisfy the compatibility condition because if you want to integrate it pressure, then this thing should equal delta square p over delta x two delta x one the partial de partial derivatives must commute otherwise you will not be able to integrate these equations for pressure and fortunately they are satisfied actually i was doing not this problem for a functionally graded cylinder mm. i was doing the same problem except i had assumed that the material properties which means uh, c1 and c2 they depend upon x 3. Then assuming my algebra is was correct, okay, that is a big if because I am the only one who checked it. So, assuming my algebra was correct, these conditions are not satisfied. But remember in that case I am assuming C 1 and C 2 are functions of x 3 then those conditions are not satisfied. Therefore, this type of solution the one we have assumed is not possible in a inhomogeneous cylinder in a cylinder made of a inhomogeneous monoevalent material with the material properties varying along the x 3 axis. If the material properties vary along the radial direction then people had solved that problem. Okay. Noel Horgan at uh, University of Virginia, which is our sister university, because I am from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. And that university is University of Virginia. So, almost every state in the US have two kinds of universities. One is University of California, other will be California State University. University of Mississippi, Mississippi State University, except possibly Maryland and Delaware, but most states have university of the state name and then state name comes first and like Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. So, anyway, so there is a big football uh, um, rivalry between the two universities. 
Um, so that's our sister university or brother university, whichever you want to call. So he had solved that problem if the, if the properties vary in the radial direction. And I wanted to solve the problem when the properties vary in the x three direction. And these conditions were not satisfied. So also, which I'm not doing it now, but supposing I do the bending problem. Bending of a in inhomogeneous fiber reinforced beam, say, I do get into that kind of trouble that um, the compatibility conditions for pressure are not satisfied, and therefore we cannot integrate, we cannot find the pressure. And if I cannot find the pressure, I cannot solve the problem. End of story. So that's why I'm saying that if we assume that C1 and C2 depend upon X3, then this problem has this problem does not have a solution of this type we assumed like displacement field that does not mean it doesn't it has solution of other it does not have any solution it has solutions but not of the type i assumed but if i do linear elasticity small deformation yes it has a solution for linear elasti elasticity it has a solution and i can control the angle of twist per unit length which means the theta prime by changing the shear modulus in the three direction okay you tell me this is the angle of twist i want i can tell you this is how your mu should vary so that for linear elast elasticity it works it when the problem has a solution it's only for the non linear part that it does not have a solution. Again, assuming my algebra was correct, because I could have made a mistake too. So, so I think that's why it's critical to check this. And these conditions are satisfied. So, so then if they are satisfied and we have partial derivatives, then we can find delta p over delta theta. So that means like, and so that's delta p over delta x1, delta x1 over delta theta plus delta p over delta x2, delta x2 over delta theta. Now remember, x1 is r cosine theta and x2 is r sine theta. So, the, so you can find a relationship between the two and it comes out to be 0. If you substitute for delta p over delta x1 from here, delta p over delta x2 from here and x delta x1 over delta theta from here and x2 over delta theta from there and then I think it yeah delta p over delta theta comes out to be 0. Oh. I think I, I skipped one step though. So these conditions, compatibility conditions, they require, yeah, I think I skipped that part. So these compatibility conditions, there are, um, this is with respect to x1, x2, and then x2, x3. So like I should have write similar one like this. I should write like that also. And then x1, x2. These require that theta double prime should be 0. So these compatibility conditions are satisfied if theta double prime is 0, which means that the angle of twist is some constant. Uh, well, angle of twist is constant, and then theta is tau of x3 plus a constant and now you use the boundary condition that at x3 equal to 0 theta is 0 therefore you can get rid of this constant okay. so 
Yeah. So when I did the problem for the inhomogeneous cylinder, this condition theta double prime equal to zero, of course, doesn't come because my modulus like C1 and C2 depend upon X3. So when you differentiate, then you don't get this condition, but you you basically cannot satisfy these. And that's why that problem has uh, no solution. Okay, but this one has a solution because C1, C2 are constants. So, so if delta P over delta theta is zero, delta P over delta X3 is zero, so that means P can only depend upon R. So if, if delta P over delta X3 came out to be zero from equilibrium equations, also, the equilibrium equations give us uh, our equilibrium equations plus these compatibility conditions give us this. So, therefore, P must be a function of R only. And the stresses vary only in the radial direction. So, I think um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is just give you the final result. Um, so, what about the forces here? The axial force. So, the axial force M3 should equal what? What should be the total resultant axial force? We cannot satisfy point Y. So, the total axial force. So what should be that? What is the normal to outer su the surface? Outward normal? 3, 3. So, so that is the normal to this n is 0, 0, 1. So, the traction vector will be F i will be T i j n j and that is delta j 3 because only three directions. So, it is T i 3. So, T 1 3, T 2 3, T 3 3. So, if you find n, so n i resultant force should equal T i 3 2 pi r d r. So, that is the area. and then you integrate from 0 to the outer radius. So, 0 to outer radius say capital R. Or if you, you want to use A up to A, whichever way you like. So, does that make sense? So, what we get then is that uh, this thing equals minus C1 plus twice C2 pi outer radius 4 over 4 tau square delta I3, which means N1 is 0 and N2 is 0 and N3 is non-zero. If you do linear elasticity, in linear elasticity, we neglect terms that have tau square, angle of twist per unit length square. Remember this tau was theta prime is tau, the angle of twist per unit length. In linear elasticity, we neglect terms which are quadratic or higher order powers in, in tau. So, in this case, what you get is then the axial force is proportional to tau square. It depends upon C1 plus C2 twice C2. So, it the sign whether it should be positive or negative, whether this result or value will come out to be positive or negative will depend upon the sign of this C1 plus 2 C2. This is positive, this is polar moment of inertia. So, if you want to magnify the effect, 
take a cylinder of larger radius and is proportional to the angle of twist square. So, if you do not apply n 3, remember no, n 1 is 0, n 2 is 0, it is only n 3. If you do not apply n 3, what will happen? The cylinder will not be able to maintain its length, because we assumed that the length is maintained and the maintaining of that length requires that we apply axial force, whether it is positive or negative. I cannot tell you because I do not know the sign of C 1 plus 2 C 2. So, either it will it is either it will stretch or it will compress and the elongation or contraction is proportional to tau square. So, that is another check on Mooney Rivlin material then that you take a cylinder of made of the rubber you have tested in tension or um, or the membrane problem we did in the morning. If the both of those tests are satisfied, you are happy, yes, it behaves Mooney Rivlin, do this one and if this one passes, you are in good shape. I mean, so when if do this one does not pass, again that is not a Mooney Rivlin material. When I say passes, I mean there might be like 5 percent difference. So, it is all up to you how much error you are willing to accept. That is what I mean by passes, like if the if the axial force you measure, it comes out to be 100 Newtons and theory says it should be 105 Newtons, it is ok, I mean it is no big deal. But if the theory says it is a 1000 Newtons and you get experimentally 100 Newtons, there is something, this is not Mooney Rivlin material then. Of course, it does not tell you what material it is, I mean it does not answer that question, but it does assure that you should not be designing based on the assumption of a Mooney Rivlin material. So, it is so like one way street, it does not tell you what you should do, it only tells you yes, you are going the in the right direction or not. And then the next one we are going to do is. Uh, maybe after the break, uh, bending of the bar. That I think, well I have copied from my book onto the notes, so I, because uh, I cannot remember those equations. This is a lot of algebra involved. So, we will do the, oh, we have a choice. We can do the inversion of the tube. We have not done that either. Maybe we can do both of them. We will see. See, pulling tube inside out again for Mooney Rivlin material. This is a member of the Erickson's family of solutions and same thing about um, bending of the bar. It is a member of Erickson's family of solutions. Okay. So, I will maybe 15 minutes break, then we will be done at 3. So, those of you who have a flight or, or need to go to Calcutta, then you should be okay. So, we will be done at 3, that is what I promise. So, I will take a shortcut and we will get done by 3. Okay. So, let us go and have coffee. Huh? As per the schedule, it should be four. No. You are, you told me to, st oh, well, it is okay. No, no, now it is 3. So, after you are done, it will end at 4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, you mean coffee will come at 4? Oh, that is what he oh. meant. <laughs> it is okay. We can have 10 minute break. Comes outside surface. So, that will cause a lot of strain. But we will start with this. So, we take this tube and there is a pressure P inner and pressure P outer. And then when we after we have set up the problem, we will solve it for the case when the inner pressure and the outer pressures are 0. That is what I said there can be two solutions. One in which tube, there is nothing happens to the tube, it is not deformed. And in, in the other case, inside surface will become outside surface. So, there will be lot of strains induced in the tube. Mo again, mo 
material is going to be Mooney revenant. And the so if we take this is inner radius, and if we um, work in terms of the cylindrical coordinates. like r theta and z is a little bit easier because the outward normal here has components n has components 1, 0, 0. In the radial direction only it has component, right? And the inner one here has components minus 1, 0, 0 it is an r theta z coordinate system. I know I did not cover the equilibrium equation and all that stuff in cylindrical coordinates, but I think most of uh, how many of you are familiar with cylindrical coordinates? So, all of you are familiar ok good. So, the so we are going to assume that under this radial pressure applied on the inner surface and, uh, and the outer surface or any one of the two or both, the tube expands radially. So, little r is a function of big R. I am not telling you what function it is, and theta does not angular position does not change, and z. So, little z becomes big Z over the length. Say. I mean, the, the, the total length can change. So, it is not plane strain. And if it is plane strain, then d will be 1. So, if d is 1, then the length has not changed. Otherwise, the length can change. So, this again we are assuming a class of deformation. We are not solving the problem as if you are given the boundary conditions, you are given the material and you find uh, the deformations. So, we are saying we are going to only find deformations of this type. Again, the material is incompressible. And mm, what so the boundary conditions are T R R is minus T outer at R equal to R outer and is minus P inner at R equal to R inner and this is the um, T R theta and T R Z are zeros both on the inner and the outer surfaces and the ends they are basically deforming uh, homogeneously because uh, we are saying little z equal big z over d. So, there may be pressure required at the ends, there may be no pressure required at the ends and if you do not re require pressure then the length may change. Okay, so, now let us write f. So, first part is simple is delta r over differentiate r with respect to r like little little x 1 with respect to big x 1. But when you do theta with when you do r with respect to theta is 0, r with respect to z is 0. Easier part theta oh pressure that uh, twist not quite because there um, I could have said theta, but there, there theta depended upon x 3. I, I mean I could have worked in r theta z coordinate system. I think that is what you meant right. Okay. So, theta with respect to r is 0, theta with respect to theta is 1, but that is not in physical components. 
So, the length element is really little r times theta and big r times big theta in the uh, in physical components. So, these are physical components not tensorial components and then this part is simple 0, 0, 0, 1 over d. Okay. So, this is these are uh, what we call covariant derivatives, contravariant derivatives and then you use the metric tensor to convert tensorial components to physical components and um, that is done here. So, the only place where the uh, conversion comes into picture is really G only G 2 2 the mat the 2 2 component of the metric tensor is non zero and not non zero because third component is also non zero it is 1 first component is 1, but this one has r and big r in it. So, if you are comfortable with this then life is a little simpler it is okay? ok good. So, then b because this is diagonal. So, we can say r prime square 0 0 0 r square over r square 0 0 0 1 over d and b inverse is easily found. What is the determinant of f? Because the material is incompressible. So, determinant of f should be 1 is determinant of f in physical components. Otherwise, you have to worry about contravariant covariant components. So, that is oh, since it is a diagonal matrix. So, you just multiply the three diagonal terms and that gives us r prime r over big R d and that should be 1. So, this means that d r r d r should equal r d d r. This r prime is a derivative of little r with respect to big r. Am I am I going too fast? If we integrate this, so we get r square over 2 equal to d r square over 2 and constant of integration I will write it as a over 2. So, I do not have to worry about 2s all the time. Instead of writing a I can write a over 2. So, 2 cancels now you can see if a is negative if a is negative little r can become less than big r. Right? And of course, I am not giving you the solution yet, but if if indeed a is negative then little r can become less than big r. So, that is what I mean by this point moving here. Okay, now, so we need uh, equilibrium equations. So that's T is minus P times identity plus C1 B is this. If R square is that, then if you differentiate it, you get twice R R prime is equal to 2 D R. So R prime we can write it as d r over little r. So, that uh, is r prime square. So, that is d square and if I write over r square times big r square which is little r square minus a over d I am writing only in terms of little r rather than mixed ones. See this is r prime square, r prime square is 
dr over little r. So that is d square over little r square times big r square, but big r square from here is r square minus a over d. So that is c and then this is 0, 0. Zero R square over R square, so that's R square over big R square, which is R square minus A over D. Zero, 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 one. No, one over D square. Oh, I wrote it wrong here. It's one over D square. And plus C2, B inverse, which is the reciprocal of this. So that's R square D over D R square minus A, 0, 0, 0, R square minus A over D R square, 0, 0, 0, 1 over d square. Oh, sorry, d square. No, here, here, because oh, it, this is b in words. So C to b in words. This is B inverse of, since the diagonal matrix, so all I have to do is take the inverse, take the reciprocal of each diagonal term, and that's what I have done. And I think I copied everything right. I'm sorry? This one? Oh, here? This one? So it's R square. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. You are right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now we are okay? So let's look at the equilibrium equations. So the equilibrium equation is delta T R R over delta R plus T R theta over theta 1 over R plus the T R Z over Z plus E R R minus T theta theta over R equal to 0. And then we write in the theta direction and in the Z direction. Right? So we write in the, this is in the r direction, then we write in the theta direction and the z direction. Here, all of these quantities depend only upon r. Nothing depends upon theta and z. So if we write in the theta direction, what we will get is minus delta p over delta theta equal to 0. And if we write in the z direction, we will get minus delta p over delta z equal to 0. So I did not write them, but that is the only thing that will come up. Because pressure is the only variable that can depend upon r theta and z, but the non-pressure terms, which means these two terms, they do not have theta and z in them. So I do not need to write it, right? Is it okay? So that means pressure is a function of radius only. Because pressure cannot depend upon z, pressure cannot depend upon theta, so it can only depend upon z. Good. This term is T r theta is 0. 
what about TRZ? And since everything is a function of R only, so this partial derivative becomes total derivative. Okay. So now I integrate this. So I can say first dt r over dr equals negative of this and then I integrate over the um, radius. I integrate with respect to r. So if I do that, so we will get t r r from inner radius to outer radius. I left some blank there and that is t theta theta minus t r r over r and that is from inner radius to outer radius. And what about this? The boundary conditions are that T R on, on the outer surface is minus P outer and on the inner surface is minus P inner. Right? So, so this is one equation t theta theta t theta theta minus t r r so p will cancel because both involve minus p but then you are saying t theta theta minus t r r so p will cancel so what we will get is then c2 oh, so this is t theta theta so c2 times this minus c1 times this and they have A and D in them. So, if you like, I can write that. So, that is 1 over R C2 R square minus A over D R square minus uh, T R R. So, that is C1 or uh, D R square over r square minus a and that's dr good is it okay so if i want to do the inversion problem inversion means like pulling tube inside out there is no pressure applied on the inner surface there is no pressure applied on the outer surface. So, this this term is 0 there are two constants in it a and d I am sorry no this is t theta theta Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you are right. Yeah, I had written only these two terms. You are right. Yeah, I didn't. So let me erase it because otherwise it will take me more time to write it. No, you are absolutely right. I'm sorry. I I did not write completely. So it's t theta theta minus t r r over r dr. It's my fault. Yes. So haste waste haste makes waste that is what was happening. <laughs> so, if you substitute for t theta theta and t r r pressure will cancel you will get this term that term this term that term and all of them have little r in it and constants a and d in it. We do not know r inner 
and we do not know our outer right so change the variable of integration to capital r and there is a relationship between little r and capital r so change change the variable of integration from little r to capital r upper case r then you know our outer and our inner so we can in principle we can evaluate this integral in principle if we are doing the inversion problem there is no axial force applied at the end so what is the force here what is the axial force at the ends so the axial force the axial force at the ends is f axial is t z z the outward normal is in the z direction so t z z 2 pi r d r and you integrate this from r inner to r outer and that should be zero now this equation involves pressure in it because when i write t z z i will have minus p plus c1 over d square plus c2 times d square so i have to find that pressure so whereas i was trying to not find the pressure but i'm um, stuck i have to find it so the way basically we do it is because delta because p is a function of r only so you write the in this equation dp over dr will show up so you integrate it and then you use the boundary condition either on the outer surface or on the inner surface to find the constants of integration because when you integrate dp over dr one a constant of integration will show up right and that's besides that is in addition to a and d we have here but we know trr what we used was trr on the outer surface minus trr on the inner surface what we know trr on the outer surface is zero for the inversion problem and trr is zero on the inner surface for the inversion problem use one of the two to find that constant of integration so now we have two equations this one and this one to find a and d and if this these two equations have a solution that has that gives you a negative then that is the inversion problem and if a is positive that's radial expansion okay and indeed the problem has a solution so let me show you that think so that is this i hope you can see it that is section on inversion of a tube it says functionally graded forget about that part because in functionally graded c1 and c2 are functions of radial coordinate um, again it's a fancy word I mean, you know these days seriously i mean if you open a pa any journal you will get maybe five papers on functionally graded materials and all of them say these are an advanced class of material these are new materials but mathematicians were studying it in 1920s they were calling it inhomogeneous materials seriously i'm not kidding I'm geological people see in, in geology the earth the ground people were modeling it as material properties depend upon the depth from the top surface because of sedimentation say 
the material settles, right? So, the rocks that are near the top surface have different property from the rock that is say 100 kilometers below it. So, they said, okay, let Young's modulus vary as a function of the depth from the top surface. They did not use the word functionally graded. But I'm not downplaying anybody's work because as you can see, I'm using it too. So, it's not that I'm saying um, that the work of anybody is not good or we should not work on these kind of materials. But I think those statements we make, including myself, are false, that these are advanced class of materials, that these are new materials. New is, a, I mean, these are not new materials. Your teeth, my teeth, these are functionally graded materials. Outer surface of our tooth has different properties as you go in. Uh, outer surface is probably harder than the inner one. So, it is a functionally graded material. Nature made it, designed it so that our teeth, um, they work great. They last for, um, like in my case, say, well, in most people cases, they last for a long time, 70 years, 60 years. All we have to do is brush them. What? So, anyway, so, so f ignore this part, functionally graded cylinder. But, uh, okay, so this is the, this is how TRR and T theta theta vary when you evolve the tube. So, I as you can see, TRR is very small as compared to T theta theta. And when the, the case when alpha equal to 0, alpha and beta are 0, which is curve number 2, that is for a homogeneous material. Okay. So, uh, alpha, be, alpha and beta equal to 0 is for a homogeneous material, the others are for non-homogeneous materials. So, the, the point is that the problem does have a solution. You can evolve the tube like inside out and the hoop stresses are large as compared to the radial stresses, which of course you will expect that. Because what we are, the boundary condition is on radial stresses, not on the hoop stresses. We cannot specify hoop stresses. And the, the Cauchy's um, theorem only said T i j and j equal to f. So, only you can specify because r is in the n is in the r direction. So, you can only specify t r r, t theta r and t z r, but not t theta theta. So, the depending upon the values of c 1 and c 2, you may get quite different solution. It is possible that for some values of c 1 and c 2, you will not get any solution that is that has a negative. So, that means the tube that tube cannot be inverted and if you force it, it will crack or it will not say it will not stay a cylindrical tube. It may not crack. It will not satisfy this deformation field. Remember, we are assuming deformation field. So, if you force it and the C 1, C 2 are such that there is no solution, then it will not stay a tube, it will become something else. Also, if you do the problem numerically, I mean, I do not know what Abacus will give us. This one, I mean, we most of it is done analytically except for solving these two algebraic equations and that. Um, does give a negative. And no, I do not, I cannot answer the question whether um, we were lucky to choose C 1, C 2 to start with, which were right, or Barami, who did the numerical simulations or computed the results, he played with it so that we got a negative. negative. And that part I do not, I cannot answer it because I do not know whether he played with it or not. So, so, the bottom line is 
Muni resonant material that constitutive equation does predict two solutions of the same equilibrium problem as there should be. If th there may be more than two, but at least there should be two, at least two, and we do get two. So, so that shows you the beauty of nonlinear elasticity. Of course, you could not do this in in linear elasticity. You could not even dream of uh, pulling the tube inside out. But in nonlinear elasticity, yes, and then you same thing happens in the in the sphere problem, hemisphere problem. That you can invert it inside out. And since I'm, I have the files open. Let me show you what happened with the. See. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. When I was a student at Hopkins, Professor Bell, who is an experimentalist or who was an experimentalist, incidentally, Professor Bell did not have a PhD, but he did innovative experiments. He, seriously, I'm not kidding. Like he, he did. Uh, he used diffraction grating to measure strains based on the wavelength of light. So the resolution was, roughly speaking, the wavelength of light. So what he did, yeah, you are surprised. So what he did was, let's say this is a. You guys are taking me into different directions, but uh, I mean, well, I should not blame you. So supposing this is a tube, right, or metal metallic bar. So he will, not he will, but the machinist uh, will um, etch, uh, use a lathe cutting machine to draw lines which were, um, I think there were 10,000 lines in an inch. The more you put, the better it is. And you shine polarized light on it. So you can measure the spacing between the lines. Now if you deform it, either compress it or pull it, it is up to you, the distance between the lines will change. Or of course, right? That polarized light will give you diffraction grating. It will give you diffractions. And by measuring those diffractions, you can see you can measure those diffractions based on the wavelength of light. If it is if it's off by one wavelength, you will see a different pattern. So which means if this distance increased by one wavelength of light, you will you can measure it. And if you take say yellow light or red light or green light, their wavelengths are different, then you can depending upon which polarized light you use, you can find how much the distance between these lines changed. Great, right? You can, you don't have to touch it. Um, you are not touching the uh, uh, this test piece. And they, of course, they were using a shock tube or a split top to shock tube to load it under dynamic conditions. Those strains, strain rates are of the order of 10 to the power 4 or 5 per second, 10,000 per second strain rate. So you are measuring these things in milliseconds or microseconds. And so they could measure the properties uh, of the material at high strain rates without using any of the present they use. Nowadays, we can use cameras. So these cameras, they can take million frames per second. No kidding, million, oh, million, 10 lakh frames per second. Because I, I, we are used to millions, and you, we are here we are used to crores and lakhs, right? So it's ten lakhs frames per second, and then say you can find out uh, if you compare the two frames, and if we have enough resolution to see how many, <coughs> what is the pixel, this, how many pixels the point moved, you can find strain rates. 
quite accurately. But the point was that he did it um, like 50 years ago. I mean, at that time, of course, nobody had cameras that took um, 10 lakh frames per second. Okay, so what I was going to show you was the torsion problem, and thus. Uh, It doesn't load it. It says file not found. And well, sorry. Otherwise, I was going to show you that. Uh, yeah. Well, it's okay. I mean, it's not a. Uh, it's no big deal. See, I was going to show you that, indeed, the problem, the compatibility conditions are not satisfied. That I was talking about delta square p. That p should have to, second order derivatives of p should be should commute. And they don't commute for this problem if C1 and C2 depend upon X3. So the problem does not have a solution. But linear elasticity does have a solution. And that's what I was going to show you. But anyway, the file doesn't load. And as you can see, it's, since the paper is written by me, so all the mistakes are my own. I cannot blame a student now that he or she did not do the work right. It's my mistake if if there is a mistake in it. But um, I think maybe that's a good place to stop. Even though I said I will do the bending problem, probably I won't do, well, not probably, I will not do the bending problem. Can you please show Erickson's paper? Like if it's per year or per journal. Erickson's paper? Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, I can show you Erickson's paper. I can give you the journal. It's in Z A M M, but I have the reference. Number 28. I hope you can read it. I don't know. Should I blow it up a little more? Yes. Uh, my memory was not terribly bad. I said, nine, is this a 1954 paper? It will take you a week to study it. Not, I mean, if you want to really follow it, it may take more than a week. Even though the paper is only what? Oh, it's 20 pages, 21 pages. So it can take more than a week. Certainly, it will take more than a week. It will not take one hour or two hours. I mean, of course, you can read the English part and say what he proved. But if you want to go through the math, then it will take time. Easier part might be, I think some of one of you had downloaded that book by uh, non, like nonlinear field theories. I think Trussler and Knoll have summarized that paper in that book. So it may be easier to read uh, 
nonlinear field theories than to read this paper. It's up to you. Um, I'm not saying um, that you should not study this paper. You should, but have patience. And as I said before, after you study it, you will see there are five families, and then you Google it, people are still working on the fifth family. Or at least they were working on like maybe 10 years ago. So I, I can't say today. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for being very patient with me. And enjoy the rest of your academic life.